Under his pants, he is wearing magic underwear. And he believes that a convicted con man got golden tablets that no one else could see and sat with an angel to find out that the original Jews of the Bible were living in North America. She's got to stay focused and tight on these curves. <laughs> Welcome to Utah! Huh? Have you been to Salt Lake City before? Uh, no, but, but I can't talk now. Do you know about the Church of Latter-day Saints? Mormonism, I'm depressed by how successful it is. By giving this talk, I don't mean to devalue the religious lifestyle or those who choose to live it, but instead I aim to show the importance of allowing each individual to follow the path that makes the most sense to them. I agree that the biblical stories are equally ridiculous, but the difference is we don't know they were written by known con men, but in fact he was yeah. a yeah. known felon. Yeah. How exactly did a bored 14-year-old in the 1800s go on to deceive 16 million people worldwide? American prophet Joseph Smith claimed to have found golden plates buried within a hill in upstate New York. These relics would be the foundation of Mormonism, or the Church of Latter-day Saints, one of the fastest growing religions that was founded upon a teenager's fantasy. Joseph Smith grew up in western New York during the early 19th century. His family was deeply pious and engrossed with the Second Great Awakening, a Protestant religious reemergence in the United States from 1790 to 1840. The Second Great Awakening took place in the Burn District, several counties of New York State which experienced great religious experimentation. The Burn District got its name because everyone who lived there seemed to burn with religious zeal. Some religions to come out of the Second Great Awakening were the Shakers, also known as the Quakers, the Fox Sisters of Hydesville, and the Oneida Society. These rather modern faiths had some strange practices. The Fox Fox sisters would commune with the dead through something known as table wrapping. The Oneida Society practiced group marriage, possibly even inspiring Mormon polygamy. Though some new religions would fail to produce a large following, others would flourish and evolve into modern denominations. After all, this was an insane time of religious exploration. With a little bit of creativity and dedication, one boy could fool the masses. As a teenager, Joseph attended one or more of these gatherings, but was conflicted and confused. He did not know which faith was the correct one. While praying in the woods at the age of 14, Joseph was supposedly visited by two personages, described as God the Father and Jesus Christ. God and Jesus told Joseph not to choose any of the proposed religions, and that contemporary faiths had turned aside from the gospel. Even after speaking with literally God himself, it took another three years for Joseph to write, I mean, find his preferred faith. One night in 1823, during his probably 46th prayer of the day, the angel known as Moroni visited Joseph, instructing him to find a divine book consisting of golden plates, the one and only Book of Mormon. However, for four years, Joseph was not allowed to take the plates from their resting spot on Camorra Hill. Apparently, there are three exclusive witnesses who saw the angel Moroni, the Book of Mormon, and other holy artifacts, Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris, and David Whitmer. It's pretty funny because these three men circled jerked to Joseph Smith's story, stating that they too had the same vision of golden plates before even meeting each other. But, all three witnesses would eventually split from Joseph's theology. In fact, Whitmer would go on to start his own denomination. Another eight witnesses apparently saw and handled these golden plates. I guess Moroni wasn't around that weekend. But again, how are we supposed to believe this, when all eight of the witnesses are members of Smith and Whitmer's families? Early critics of Joseph Smith believed him to be a conman and treasure hunter, who traveled to ancient Native American burial grounds in hopes of digging up any sort of valuable items. There was not that much to do in the 1800s. This was a common practice among youths to pass time. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. They really saw the golden plates 
Smiths and the Angel Moroni, there were other relics supposedly found with the golden plates, such as the Urim and Thummim, ancient seer stones that Joseph would use to translate the golden plates, and of course the Sword of Laban, passed down for generations, which, again, no one besides a select few can corroborate. <sighs> Are you smelling it yet? Well, if not, then this is where it gets weird, if it wasn't weird already. Because the golden plates found by Smith were written in Reformed Egyptian. This Reformed Egyptian came from the supposed Nephites and Lamanites, two civilizations that came from Jerusalem to the Americas before Christ's birth. The Book of Mormon also states another civilization named the Jaredites came to America even earlier, around the time God separated humanity for building the Tower of Babel. Remember, we're just talking about religious scripture here. In keeping with the Mormon tradition that America is a promised land, another belief is that after Jesus' resurrection, he visited North America during an age of war and darkness for the tribes. Due to these conflicts, the Nephites and Jaredites would all die out, leaving only the Lamanites to survive, becoming the ancestors of Native Americans. So the Mormons retconned Native American history. Right. This information is important because Joseph Smith would go on to find the plates written by a man named Moroni. Moroni pledged to both believers and non-believers that if they repent, follow Jesus, and love the Heavenly Father, they can become perfect. This is known as Moroni's promise, which would become one of the pillars of Mormonism. And Moroni was the son of Mormon, for whom the Book of Mormon is named after. He was also the last survivor of the Nephite civilization, and was instrumental in passing down the true gospel to the world. Thus, he became an angel, guiding Joseph Smith to his writings of God's true message centuries later. The message manifested itself into Joseph's new religion, the Church of Christ, founded in 1830. After four years, the religion would grow and change its name to the Church of Latter-day Saints. Latter-day Saints meaning members are living in the days just before the second coming of Christ. Speaking of Christ, most contemporary renditions of Joseph Smith portray him with near-perfect features, reminiscent of the romanticization of Christ in modern art, or to be honest, a certain perceived master race. There are tall tales of Joseph Smith that make him appear holier than thou, including the time he refused alcohol to numb the pain of of his leg surgery, or the time he calmed a storm for people who had faith in him. Mormons like to use these instances of miracle work in order to draw parallels with Jesus. There actually aren't any fully authenticated photos of Smith online. The best image of his likeness that exists is an oil portrait of Joseph Smith, created around 1842. However, his oil portrait looks noticeably different from images displayed by the LDS Church. Before before we talk about the Book of Mormon, it's better to clarify that Mormons hold other texts sacred. They follow the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. The Articles of Faith, a declaration of religious opinions written by Joseph Smith. The Book of Abraham, which consists of Egyptian scrolls discovered by adventurer Antonio Labolo and translated by Joseph Smith. The Book of Abraham is particularly interesting because it talks about the curse of Ham. The curse of Ham occurred in Genesis when Ham Ham, the son of Noah, discovered his father naked in a tent and either had sexual relations with him, didn't cover him, or mocked him, depending on your source. Ham's son Canaan was cursed with a dark complexion, referred to as the curse of Cain, and the title servant of servants referred to as the curse of Ham, all because Noah was pissed off. These verses of the Bible, incorporated into Mormon doctrine, would be used by Joseph Smith and like-minded individuals to justify slavery in the pre-Civil War era. Smith would also use this passage as a means to bar black men from joining the Mormon priesthood. Other texts that Mormons adhere to are the Doctrine and Covenants, a collection of revelations from the prophet Joseph Smith and lesser-known Latter-day Prophets, and the Pearl of Great Price, more ancient Egyptian texts translated by Joseph Smith and accepted by his church. However, without a doubt, the most important is the Book of Mormon, which is made up of five sections. The small plates of Nephi, 
the large plates of Nephi, the plates of Mormon, the words of Mormon, and the plates of Ether. Besides describing the history of the Nephites, Lamanites, and Jaredites in America, these plates act as scripture for the Mormon religion. The Book of Mormon is comparable to the Bible in the fact that it shares similar doctrine and is divided into smaller books or chapters titled after the primary author. An easy example is the four main gospels in the Bible are named after the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Conversely, in the Book of Mormon, examples include the Book of Jacob, the Book of Omni, and the Book of Alma, all named after Israelites who came to America around 1000 BC. Now, are we even certain these people existed? No because archaeologists have found no evidence of these civilizations in America. Once again, let's give them the generous benefit of the doubt and say these civilizations existed, and that the golden plates hold text of forgotten wisdom. Let's look at some of the Mormon concepts. First off, Mormons hate water. They believe God rebuked all water, and that Satan has total control over rivers, oceans, and lakes. For all we know, this is why Mormons live in Utah, a landlocked arid state. Besides their lakes, of course, which are apparently evil. One excerpt from the Book of Mormon says, Behold, I, the Lord, in the beginning blessed the waters, but in the last days, by the mouth of my servant John, I cursed the waters. Another peculiar belief is that Mormons believe in the star or planet of Kalab, described in the Book of Abraham as being a celestial body closest to heaven. It it is said that one day on Kalab is 1,000 years on Earth. Yeah, there's no evidence that this planet exists. Although some major lore is taken from Abrahamic religions, one difference in Mormonism is that Jesus is Lucifer's brother, and that Jesus was made savior of humanity because he wanted to give us all free will. On the other hand, Lucifer rebelled against God and wanted to rule over Earth without morality, forcing humans to just become gods. To be honest, Lucifer's option doesn't sound too bad. Another fascinating Mormon concept is that there are three heavens. The Telestial, Terrestrial, and Celestial Kingdoms, similar to the Rings of Hell in Dante's Inferno just a lot lamer. The Telestial is the lowest of the three kingdoms, reserved for people who only follow civil laws. The Terrestrial Kingdom comes second, occupied by people who only followed the Law of Moses. At the top is the Celestial Kingdom, where God, Jesus, and those that follow his law reside. They go as far as to believe once you arrive at the Celestial Kingdom, you become a god. So, you're telling me Lucifer was cool with just making us gods from the start. Also at the highest level, male Mormon followers partake in endless celestial sex. In order to reach this level of endless sex, Mormons must adhere to strict social tenets. For example, they cannot consume alcohol, tobacco, coffee, or even tea. They are also discouraged from marrying outside their religion, and it's considered a serious sin to have sex before marriage. Some Mormons have creatively devised ways to skirt the specific theological restriction, such as soaking and ATMing. Soaking, defined by the Urban Dictionary, it's when you um, stick your penis inside of the vagina, but you don't move it, you don't thrust or anything, and it kind of like um, it's not really a sin, it's not premium. While ATMing, on the other hand, can best be explained by popular streamer Cutie Cinderella. ATMing is when, doesn't count as sex, uh, you, as a woman, you, your pants are down, and the guy takes his dick and he slides it up and down your butt crack until he comes. Like a credit card? <laughs> mm -hmm. ATM. And we call it ATMing. Joseph Smith knew that the best way to preserve Mormonism was to create a cultural fish tank. An echo chamber that had existential consequences if you were to deviate from his cult. I mean truth. The early Mormon church was rife with division. Leaders left on their own accord or were excommunicated. One of which was Oliver Cowdery, one of the three witnesses who found himself on the other end of Joseph Smith's lifelong ego trip. Nowadays, Mormonism is made up of three different sects. Just like Christianity has Protestants and Catholics, Mormonism has the LDS church, 
Mormon fundamentalism, and liberal reformist Mormonism. You probably know the LDS Church from their classic door-to-door -door missionaries. While Mormon fundamentalists are notorious for their polygamy, made popular by Joseph Smith himself. According to the church website, they have a pyramidal structure. The church is divided into 22 regions across the world. Those regions are further divided into stakes, each consisting of 5 to 12 wards, which is usually a single church or parish. All this to say that the Mormon church system is vast and confusing with varying levels of power. And if you're not trying to steal Russell M. Nelson's look, you're gonna want the help of today's video sponsor. Which is why today's video is sponsored by Keeps. Keeps is a subscription service that helps men keep their hair. They offer clinically proven treatments that help combat the symptoms of hair loss. Best of all, all of Keeps treatment plans are personalized, doctor recommended, and delivered right to your doorstep. You don't even have to leave your house. Two out of three men will experience hair loss by the age of 35, but Keeps has you covered. Keeps offers research-backed, clinically proven treatments to stop hair loss and improve hair growth. Each treatment plan comes with one year of unlimited messaging, so you can connect with your prescribing doctor about anything, anytime. Rest assured that Keeps physicians will help you select the right products and treatments for your specific condition and hair goals. You can also easily subscribe to refill reminders so you never run low on the products that you need to take the best care of your hair. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash filion or just click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Philion. And thank you to Keeps for sponsoring this video. Besides the main sex, it's well known that Mormonism takes from Abrahamic religions, such as Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. Mormons even consider themselves Christian, but are they? Mormons hold a good amount of conflicting views with Christianity. For example, they reject the Nicene Creed, which is the statement of faith for Christianity, and they call the Trinity the Godhead. They also have different names for Jesus and God, naming them Jehovah and Elohim respectively. They believe that God was once a man on another planet, born to an unknown god and goddess, before being exalted to godhood himself. One Mormon ceremony, similar to Christianity's baptism, is posthumous baptism, where someone is baptized as proxy on behalf of an already deceased same-sex person. This was a practice done during the time of Paul the Apostle, around 50 AD, restored by the LDS Church and is one such ceremony or ordinance that can only be performed at a Mormon temple not a Mormon church. Mormon temples are reserved for ordinances that involve eternal significance, such as marriage, baptisms, or an endowment. An endowment is a two-part ordinance, which again is just their word for ceremony, in which a Mormon takes on a new name and receives temple garments, which is basically underwear that they must wear at all times throughout their life. And here's Cutie Cinderella explaining these garments from her own perspective. Garments and garments are special blessed underwear that would go to about here. No, here, about here, uh, about here in length that you wear under your clothes at all time, and about here in here. this neckline. They're a bodysuit. The second part of the ordinance is known as the second anointing, where men and women are exalted to kings, queens, priests or priestesses in the afterlife. These ordinances are supposedly sworn. Mormons are forbidden to discuss temple matters outside the temple. According to the Associated Press in Salt Lake City, some posthumous baptisms have been blocked for certain people such as the Las Vegas gunman, Stephen Paddock, and Charles Manson. Although these concepts seem random, they point to one main goal of Mormon theology, creating a heaven on earth, or what they call Zion. Presumably, this goal would be achieved after everyone lives in perfect harmony by following the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith tried to replicate this in America by establishing rather prosperous towns in Ohio, Missouri, and Illinois that acted as a safe haven for his people against the US government. These towns were also seen as possible Zions, and in many cases, the federal government had no idea the Mormons were taking over so much land. Joseph Smith also introduced the practice of polygamy and could have sired several children, though it is staunchly looked down upon by 
modern-day Mormons. According to Andrew Jensen, an assistant LDS church historian, a list of Joseph's wives by 1887 was 27 women, besides his legal wife, Emma Smith. Currently, there are 49 women on the list, and some were even married to other men at the same time. Although Joseph Smith's Zionist towns were successful in their own right, they were seen as interlopers and dissenters by locals, political rivals, and other religious denominations, often being berated and attacked on site. One conflict between Mormons and non-Mormons even led to a war in Missouri, known as the Mormon-Missouri War of 1838. Raids and fights lasted two weeks before Joseph Smith was arrested tried for treason, and sentenced to death. Before his trial could even begin, he would escape with the help of some apologetic guards, fleeing to Illinois. You see, at this point, Joseph Smith had developed the unique Mormon God complex, and tried to have sex with every woman he saw, fracturing relationships with his closest associates by proposing marriages to their wives. Knowing his back was against the wall, he would try to portray the Latter-day Saints as a marginalized group in order to gain political prowess, even running for president in 1844. Smith and co-conspirators would burn down the Novu Expositor, a printing press in Illinois because ex-Mormons had been spreading information that was critical of Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith would then turn himself into authorities to reconcile with his biggest enemies, but soon found out they had other plans for him. The same year, on June 27th, Joseph Smith was attacked by an angry mob and killed while awaiting trial in an Illinois jail. This made Smith the first ever presidential candidate to be assassinated. Allegedly, his last words were, Oh Lord, my God, as he was shot multiple times while trying to escape out of a window. After his death, Joseph Smith was revered as a martyr, a man inspired by God that stopped at nothing to secure Zion for his people. Brigham Young, the second and longest reigning president of the Mormon church, shared Smith's beliefs and had around 56 children with 55 wives. According to John Turner in Brigham Young, Pioneer Prophet, Young believed polygamy was to ensure a big family, and that sexual desire was given by God to perpetuate the human race. Brigham Young's policies can be summarized by his speech on February 5th, 1852, in Salt Lake City. He addressed various topics, including black people, slavery, and priesthood, following in Smith's footsteps, affirming that a black person could not become a priest, for they had the mark of Cain or the mark of Ham, really, whichever was more convenient to lambash them with. The absurdity of the Mormon church would only increase as time went on. Like most religions, new leaders would exercise their power to further their political and economic agenda under the guise of faith. Everyone knows behind every great religion is a metric fuckton of money. So how exactly does the Mormon church make money? Tithing is one such method where you must pay 10% of your annual income to the church. It is also manipulatively considered a double blessing. First, it is a blessing because you are paying for the furthering of the word of Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Second, your payments show appreciation to God not material items. Yeah, just imagine tithing as literally Venmoing God. At least, that's how it's framed under this context. There are many anecdotes of people who could not afford necessities, yet still felt responsible to pay their 10%. A whistleblower from Ensign Peak Advisors, the financial institution linked with Mormonism, said the church has accumulated approximately $100 billion in assets. This is just one account that was made public. Shockingly enough, the whistleblower later asserted that the church did not use its funds properly. The revenue was not used for charitable purposes, and it was instead being used for ventures that were considered for profit, just as Jesus intended, right? The Mormon church is also known to use volunteer work in order to save money on expenses, with estimates of nearly 100,000 volunteers per year working on behalf of Mormonism. This can be seen as a smart business decision or just another way to keep money in the church's pocket. So let's get this straight. They have gargantuan investment accounts, use free labor, and are tax exempt. Sadly, these methods don't even scratch the surface of their master plan. 
Similar to billion dollar corporations like McDonald's, the Mormon church realizes that the one true way to create an empire is through real estate. So they are constantly buying vast acres of land all across the United States. In article titled 210 million sale of prime Washington farmland to LDS church approved by Anna King, the article explains how 18,000 acres were bought by the LDS church, even outbidding Bill Gates to use for planting and harvesting wheat. Here's one for you. The Mormon church is even Florida's largest private landowner after a deal to buy 400,000 acres got green lit. In fact, the LDS church owns 2% of Florida. The LDS church schemes don't end there. They plan on building a city on their Deseret Ranch for 500,000 people by the year 2080. At the moment, it's home to 44,000 cattle, which is the largest cow-calf ranch in the United States. Deseret ranches and their subsidiaries are also for-profit organizations. As Mormonism advances through the 21st century, it's fun to look at how they are mentioned in pop culture. Mormons have been portrayed in a variety of performances, ranging from Space Jam in 1996 to the Book of Mormon musical on Broadway. For the most part, Mormons are seen in a satirical light, which does not offend members of the LDS church. However, their perceived tolerance of criticism is contrasted by Mormon ad campaigns that are inseparable from corporate monologues. Everything about their religion is run like a capitalist dream. The LDS Church said in response to the Book of Mormon musical that they are quote made of sterner stuff. The church may believe some adaptations are lighthearted, but others are deemed essentially lazy. For example, the church has significant problems with HBO's Big Love, starring Bill Paxton as Bill Henriksen, a modern polygamist with three wives and seven children. The family is often described as being Mormon adjacent, which drew the attention of the LDS church. They may not present themselves as explicitly Mormon, but their behavior and lifestyle matches with Mormon fundamentalism. They also live in Salt Lake City, the HQ of the LDS Church. To combat shows like Big Love, the LDS Church reiterates the fact that polygamy is banned in the United States. It is interesting though that the majority of Mormons live in Utah, and just recently in 2020, the Utah House and Senate reduced the punishment for consensual polygamy, from a felony charge to basically a traffic ticket. Without a doubt, one of the funniest pop culture references to Mormonism is in South Park. A Mormon family moves from Utah to South Park and becomes the proverbial talk of the town. The Mormon children and parents are portrayed as too helpful. They are so nice that they convince other people to change their ways. In one instance, Randy Marsh goes to the Mormon's home to beat up the father for telling Stan Marsh differing religious views. Randy's plans rarely work out. He doesn't fight the father. Instead, he comes home with a copy of the Book of Mormon. Throughout the episode, the story of Joseph Smith is explained with almost constant singing. And that's how the Book of Mormon was written. Dum 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 dum. Matt Stone and Trey Parker, the creators of South Park, were also the creators of the Book of Mormon musical. It can be inferred that Matt and Trey don't like Mormonism very much. However, Mormons are not always featured in a strictly satirical or stereotypical nature. In the video game franchise Fallout, set in post-apocalyptic America, Mormons are one of the few remaining religions. Unlike other adaptations, Mormons are portrayed trade in a positive light, as said in an article titled, I'm a Mormon. Pop culture often mocks my faith, but Fallout treated it right. It seems a video game did right by the Mormon religion, while others see it for what it truly is. Criticism of Mormonism has only expanded since its inception because of sexist policies or historical revision. I mean, they literally believe early Jews came to America, built incredible civilizations, had cataclysmic wars, were visited by Jesus, then all died out, and the few that were remaining? Oh, 
they became Native Americans. These are inaccuracies that can be empirically proven false by science and documented evidence. But these pillars of academia are considered the philosophies of men and should not be mingled with faith. However, the Mormon church will have typical PR mumbo jumbo to appease critics. The primary method of religious indoctrination is to deny others and assert that your religion is the one true path to salvation. This creates a powerful us versus them dynamic, a complex in which they know the only truth. It's convenient for all religions to believe they are the center of the universe, creating a sense of religious tribalism where they are right and everyone else is wrong. Regardless if non-believers are thought of as proverbial sheep who have lost their way, I can't help but think that they are treated as blank templates, ready for layers of cultural brainwashing with the sole purpose of a advancing a religion. I felt deep frustration at the church's claim to have a monopoly over the fullness of truth. That the few million members are the only keepers of the real truth of what God wants today for us, and that everyone else has truth too, but through prophets and apostles and modern day revelation, the Mormons are actually the ones who have the full picture. They know what's going on. I believed that they had the truth that was going to deliver me and my family to eternal bliss in celestial glory. Mormonism is a new age religion, which makes it incredibly easy to fact check and cross reference outlandish claims of miracle work and divine intervention. It is a slap in the face to archeology, span anthropology, history, and science when Mormonism is taken seriously in any regard. When you know the origin story of Mormonism, the churches and temples begin to represent a a dystopian disconnect, towering structures of grandeur that are built upon lies. Although it may instill morality in some, it doesn't outweigh the blatant hypocrisy present in their belief systems. The most notorious Mormon stereotype is how nice they are. Smile. Smile right now. Smile. Smile a little bit. Come on, break the corners of your mouth. You right here. That's better. You just look better when you're smiling. You could say that killing them with kindness is how they defend their beliefs and fight criticism, but it's not a valiant effort of an intellectual conversation on the absurdity of their religion. I guess creating distance from traditional Joseph Smith Mormonism is through various denominations and sects. It's easy to circumvent criticism when you say you are different than that, but when your founder was a literal cult leader with 40 wives and a knack for fantasy writing, don't expect people to take you seriously. And for those of you who were a little confused, uh, you are dead and this is hell. So abandon all hope and uh, yada yada yada. Uh, we're now going to start the orientation process which will last about- Hey wait a minute, I shouldn't be here. I was a totally strict and devout Protestant. I thought we went to heaven. Yes, well I'm afraid you were wrong. I was a practicing Jehovah's Witness. Uh, you picked the wrong religion as well. Well who was right? Who gets into heaven? I'm afraid it was the Mormons. Yes, the Mormons were the correct answer. Aww. 